Father, we are in your presence, Lord. Being grateful for giving us opportunity to meet again, to study your word and to meditate on your word, Lord. Speak to us personally. Speak into our hearts and lives. The discussion we are going to have, Lord, may be meaningful and may be mutually mm. edifying, O oh Lord. Mm. Grant your strength to your servant who teaches and uh, help our hearts and minds to be open so that we may be able to perceive and receive what, what you want you to do. Because there is no Wi-Fi. Submit this time to thy throne of grace, asking for your mercies. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. No, no, no. I am I am I am going to I Praveen, did you finish your prayer? I was not very sure. Yeah, yes, Pastor. You did? Okay. I'm sorry. I got distracted by uh, the words on the on the screen. Anyway, thank you very much, Praveen. And uh, welcome again to all of you to our Wednesday evening Bible study. Glad that uh, even though we missed out, I think, the first one, we now can carry on and continue with uh, our study. And thank you for showing the interest. It's always uh, motivating when people show interest and, and attend. It makes one motivated to want to do, you know, uh, the, or make the study as, as beneficial as possible. Well, we have come to our concluding session on this series that we started some time back on spiritual disciplines. And what we are going to study today is uh, on stewardship, the discipline of stewardship. All right. Uh, so I will make some uh, use, uh, uh, refer to some scriptures. And what I'd like to do is today just share my notes with you so that you can uh, follow along with me. Uh, I have not, don't have much to cover, but. Uh, just some basic essentials of the subject of stewardship. It is a biblical topic. Um, then we will get into our discussion. So I think this is, uh, doesn't need too much of uh, time to sit down and uh, uh, discuss it. It is more of a practical issue that we need to put into, you know, we need to include into our lifestyle. So there is not much theoretical aspects that one can uh, dwell on in terms of this, but there are some scriptures in the Bible that we can refer to. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share my notes with you and I will go along with the notes along with you so that you may uh, be you know, also watching what, I, what the points I'm trying to cover. Okay, give me a moment as I bring this up on the screen. <clears throat> All right. Now, let me just see if I can um, uh, make it as big as possible. Right. I hope that is sufficient. I think you hopefully can see the, the lettering. Okay, so the question I've asked there to begin with is how do we define stewardship? And before we actually do that, let's look at some of the scriptures that seem to allude to this topic of uh, stewardship. And the first one is uh, a familiar one, Genesis 1 verse 26, talking about the creation of humanity. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, 
and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Isn't that interesting? God made us uh, and handed over the physical creation to us to have dominion or to rule. Uh, and you can use the word stewardship there, you know, uh, to be a steward of the physical creation. And uh, if you will also notice, uh, over all of the earth, in other words, uh, God is not stingy in terms of, uh, you know, allowing us to uh, exercise our rulership, our dominion, our stewardship, you know, over, the, uh, over all that he created. So I think that very clearly establishes that God had in mind uh, for man not just to be idle, but he had it in his mind to want mankind to participate in the, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in kingship, you could say, in uh, rulership. Look at 1 Peter, the second uh, verse in the, on the screen, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, it says, as each one has received a gift, minister, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So this is talking about each one, and I'm presuming it is a reference to everyone who are, uh, you know, the audience of uh, Peter writing. Uh, you know, obviously it includes the entire church. Everyone has received a gift. So in other words, uh, God made it, uh, you know, possible for, uh, for all of us to be gifted in one way or the other. And, but what is the purpose for it? Uh, to minister it to one another as good stewards. So the word steward is very clearly used here. And why is God, you know, uh, 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 sort of uh, getting into this exercise? It is his grace. It is his manifold grace. It is for him to include us in uh, the very, you know, uh, the, the very heartbeat of life. Uh, so uh, everyone is included in this. In the third scripture, we read Titus chapter 1 verse 7. This is strong. The next two uh, verses will talk about leadership in the church. It says in Titus 1 verse 7, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. And of course, there are the various uh, qualifications of a bishop. But notice one of the things that a bishop must keep in mind, that is to be a steward of God, right? Not self-willed, but, uh, you know, in other words, uh, not just looking to oneself, but making sure that we are available for God to serve him, to serve his people, <clears throat> sorry, um, and uh, to ut utilize the giftings as we have read in the book of Peter. Let's look at one more scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, it says, let a man so consider us uh, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Once again, the word steward is used there. And so uh, this is talking about the leadership and Paul includes uh, himself and all of the leadership who are servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Okay, so um, just expose you to these scriptures talking about uh, stewardship. So what are the observations we can make from reading these scriptures? And of course, many others, I'm just limiting it to just these uh, few. But like, let's look at some observations we can make before we come to a definition. A steward is like a manager, if you look at the first point, managing or manages resources for the owner. It seemed to indicate that we don't own it. We don't own the, 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 the earth, but God gives it to us to manage it. So a steward is uh, somebody uh, from a business perspective, you can say uh, uh, one who manages the resources for the owner. The owner is God, God Almighty. The second point says God entrusted 
the entire physical creation in the stewardship of humanity. We read that in Genesis chapter one, where the whole earth is under the stewardship of humanity. Um, so God uh, intends for us to uh, exercise that kind of uh, uh, rulership over all of the all of the earth. The point number three here is everyone has a gift, as the Apostle Peter tells us. Everyone is gifted, and it is through the grace of God, but it is to be used to minister to one another. So that is a, a specific thought that we are introduced in the scriptures. Biblically speaking, our gifting is to be used for the larger good, for the benefit of everyone, not uh, just ourselves. And many times uh, we think that the resources that we have control over is just for ourselves. And that is something the Bible wants to expand our mind. Uh, all right. And finally, here, uh, uh, a fourth observation we can make is leaders, that is bishops and pastors, are stewards of the mysteries of God. In other words, the spiritual, the biblical understandings that we can glean from the scriptures, the revelations that we can be privy to. We as leaders are responsible for it being taught to others. We are supposed to be faithful. We are, we are supposed to be found faithful in uh, making sure this is shared uh, this understanding is given to, uh, you know, the, the, the church as a whole. So these are some basic observations we can make as, uh, uh, as you know, we, we talk about stewardship. So having mentioned this, how can we define uh, stewardship? All right. So if you see on the screen, uh, I have said spiritual discipline of stewardship is about properly using things that God has entrusted to our care, including our possessions, finances, and time. So uh, what we keep in mind is that we have the privilege of being given the opportunity to manage all that God makes possible for us to have in our possession for the good use that God would want us to put it to, right? Uh, and it's inclusive. And in fact, maybe towards the end, we can discuss what are, what are the you know, things that we can be stewards of. Maybe we'll discuss that as we conclude. Uh, just two questions I'd like to leave you with, as you see on the screen. Number one, are we being good stewards for God? In other words, using our resources well. Notice it's the definition talks about proper use of resources that are entrusted to us. So is there a proper use or is there an abuse? And uh, that is one thing that the Bible seemed to talk about quite a bit, that we must not abuse the, the giftings that we have. Um, and that is what we are called for, the good use of all the gifts that God has given to us, the possessions that we might have opportunity to control. Uh, are they being used well rather than, rather than being abused? Point two there, are we mindful of investing in the kingdom of God? Now that is where the biblical perspective becomes very essential. Uh, we are not to be using, or rather we are not to be stewards just to, you know, for personal gain, uh, we, especially from a biblical perspective, we need to be investing that in the larger good. We would say the kingdom of God, uh, but it must benefit uh, you know, the church, uh, you know, our neighbors, uh, and of course, uh, humanity as a whole. So, those are some thoughts I can leave you with in terms of uh, how we can understand stewardship. Uh, if you want a definition, uh, you know, just something very simple. I have uh, not made it too complicated uh, <clears throat> so that we can be a little bit more uh, understanding of these things. Now, what I want to do is whenever we talk about uh, 
stewardship. Many times we are reminded of the parable of the talents. And in, indeed it is a, a parable that does talk about stewardship to some, some extent. So uh, for the remaining time, I'm just going to read the parable of the talents and make some quick observations and then uh, we will get into our discussion. So let me then go ahead and read from Matthew chapter 25, where the parable is uh, listed. It is also listed in other gospels, but uh, Matthew 25 is something that we might uh, very easily remember. Matthew 25, beginning in verse 14. Let me just read it so that you can sink, let it sink into you. And I'm sure then we can uh, uh, glean some thoughts from it. Beginning in verse 14, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Then he who received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug, dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Verse 20, so he who had received five talents came and brought other five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Okay, verse beginning in verse 24. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered, uh, scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to, the, give it to him who has 10 talents. And uh, ending here, verse 29 and 30. For to everyone who has more will be given and he will have abundance. But for him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away uh, and cast the unprofitable servant into, the, into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay, let me just make a disclaimer here. I'm not going to, you know, do an extensive study of this particular parable. Uh, I'm not going to exegete it. But I'm just going to pick up some thoughts from the context that we have today, and that is stewardship. That is all I'm going to do. So let us, uh, you know, I, I would rather not get into too much of speculation. In fact, it's not good to speculate too much. But I'm sure there are some thoughts we can glean from it in terms of stewardship. So let's look at the observations that we can make. What is the focus of the, tal of the uh, parable? And I think we can clearly say it is not necessarily on the amount that is distributed. We are told that uh, 
uh, one was given five, one was given two, one was given one according to their ability. I'm not going to speculate as to what, why, why God I mean, I said, did that or the king did that. Uh, because it doesn't seem to, that doesn't seem to be the focus. Uh, there may be a reason why it was done as two or five, two and one. Uh, it could be the, you know, as it is said, as it is said in the parable, because of the ability that each one has. So we will not go too much uh, uh, or maintain too much focus on that particular aspect of the parable. Secondly, it is also not on how it was invested. The focus doesn't seem to be too much on what did the people do with what they got? How did they invest it? Uh, was there a, a business you know, transaction involved? Was there uh, loans? Was it converted into loans and given? Uh, even that doesn't seem to be a focus. Now, there is a mention of it, but there is, that doesn't seem to be the main focus. Okay, let's move down then. Also, the focus is not so much on how the faithful are rewarded. Okay, one is given five, uh, one doubles it, so he's given five, you know, uh, um, cities to rule or whatever is mentioned here. Yeah, you have rulership over many. Some are given two, and so they are doubled. And so even that doesn't seem to be so much of a focus. But I think the real focus is point number two on your screen. It is more on whether it was used. Well, what, was, it, was it used or was it not used, right? Was there an attempt to, to, to employ it well? Uh, did the participants try their best to employ it in the, in, in the best way possible, right? Or did they keep it idle? The intention was not to keep it idle. And I like to use the word participation, you know, so the king seemed to indicate that there was, he needed to see participation, not how much it, how much they were able to grow, because even those who grew little uh, was, uh, you know, commended for their attempt. So the focus is on the attempt, whether they tried to use it well. All right, but and fun and uh, so that is one focus we can pick up from the parable. And secondly, the individual who decided not to participate, or rather to keep it idle. Now notice the motivation, why it was left unused or uh, uh, there was no participation at all from that person. It says in verse 24, then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. I was afraid, I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. No, look at the motivation. It is very unfortunate that the motivation is so very negative of the king. In fact, it's a completely false uh, picture that this individual gives about the king, that he was hard, was a hard man, he was uh, greedy for profit, reaping where you have not sown. Uh, you know, he seemed to grab uh, rather than be gracious. And so that kind of a picture made him afraid of the king. And uh, being afraid, then he decided to uh, not at all participate, not at all make use of his talent. All right, and if you if you have a look at that, the kind of motivation this person has, this is how some people look at God, isn't it? I mean, they they sometimes view God as a hard man. They view God as a very hard taskmaster. Uh, they view God as one who can never be pleased. No matter what you do, you cannot please God, right? And so this is the unfortunate uh, picture many people have about God. And that is what they tend to glean from the scriptures. 
And that is very, very unfortunate. Actually, God is not like that. In fact, he gives, if you notice that he gives to those who have more, right? In other words, he's very gracious. His grace overflows and he's only giving and giving and giving. But unfortunately, some people uh, look at God as, uh, as a very hard taskmaster. Let me look at a few more points here with you. Uh, I, uh, God does not demand what we, that we double everything he has, that he has given us. Even a small increase is acceptable. Like we see, he commended both the servants who used it. Uh, and so he's not insistent that we have to necessarily double it. But the question is, have we uh, attempted to use it? Uh, we don't need to worry about the amount of success as long as we are trying to use what he has given us. Even a feeble effort is better than none at all. All right. So uh, from, the, from the parable, we, 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 we uh, need to understand that, um, you know, uh, we don't have to worry if we make the most of, uh, or rather we literally double it or you know, triple it. That once again is not necessarily the focus. Uh, the effort we make to utilize our giftings, the talents that we have, the resources that we have is something that God commends and uh, is very much pleased with. All right, the last point, uh, on the screen that you will notice is it's wrong to speculate if this describes end time judgment. Uh, what we feel is that it, it may not necessarily be literal. Obviously, there is no talents being given to everybody as such. They, they, there is a metaphorical perspective to it. And if you notice, it's an exaggeration. It's, there is an exaggerated view towards the end. Why would that be? Many times the Bible does that. It exaggerates certain things. It is basically to help us, to motivate us to be engaged and to be, and to succeed. God wants success from us. Uh, he does not necessarily want any one of us to be a failure. And so to that extent, he would like for us to be, uh, to be given talents, gifts, resources, so that we can uh, feel good about the fact that we participate and see things being successful, see things growing, see things, you know, being engaged in gainful employment, right? So that is how God views us. And this is something that I wanted to focus on when it comes to talents and resources. All right, I've left one question at the end. What are the resources, the gifts that God gives us? So as you um, uh, make your comments or ask your questions, maybe you want to also think about what are the resources, gifts that God gives to us? What are the things that we have today that we can indeed invest and use and utilize and participate in, especially from a kingdom perspective? Okay, so I will stop sharing there and... Uh, Open it up for comments that you'd like to make. Remember, the focus is on stewardship. And so let's remain on that. Let's not get sidetracked to, uh, you know, too many theological stuff that, you know, we'd want to take out of the parable. Yes, Surimurti, I thought I saw your hand going up. Go ahead. The first two categories of persons were loving God. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead. Whereas the third category, he had contempt for unknown reason. He was having, having contempt for God. So God was making a distinction between who is loving him and who is hating him. Okay, yes, I, I, I presume you can make that uh, inference from the uh, parable. Uh, it's also interesting 
that uh, how the person views the third servant, how he views the king, uh, I thought that was interesting. And like I said, that sometimes tend to um, you know, reflect uh, the views of some of, you know, some so-called religious people. <laughs> they look at God in that manner. Right? The third category of person has already judged. The third category of person has already judged that God is a hard, hard man. Yeah. Hard, hard. Yeah. If that is your inference, uh, Suri Murthy, what? how would you then uh, apply that to stewardship? Would you like to make some connection between Please. the two? Stewardship. Steward means caretaker. In simple terms. So God in some ways wants to take care of, uh, caretake something which he has given to us. And at the same time, he is also testing whether he loves a person or not. The person loves him or not. All right. Okay. Very good. Uh... And uh, in this part, parable, parable of the talents, is the word steward used anywhere? I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, not not in this in uh, not in Matthew twenty five in this particular uh, you know translation. I've no there's no word of steward being used, but the uh, intention is there. The intention is to use what has been given to you. So, so the intention is here in this particular par parable. Uh, how we are using the gifts, as we said, how we are using the gifts. Not necessarily stewardship. Okay. All right. Any any comments uh, to what Surimurti said, or any of your own comments? May I suggest something? Yes, Vincent, go ahead. I think it all boils down to obedience. The obedience. Obedience. Okay. The the landlord who or whoever it was. Uh, gave those talents to his servants and he expected them to obey his command, whatever it was. Two of them were obedient, the third wasn't. Okay. Uh, you would like to look at it from an obedience perspective. Uh, and that, that may be well, uh, that may be correct, but I'd like to go just a little beyond that. It's... Uh, it is obedience, but it's also the joy of participation, uh, the, the, the desire to want to be included and want to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, sort of uh, be involved with God in the larger uh, perspective of life in the kingdom of God. So yes, obedience is uh, definitely very much part of it, but maybe we can also consider or look at it from the perspective of uh, enjoying what God has prepared for us. Uh, that is, you know, uh, very interestingly in this particular translation, it says when the Lord commends uh, the, the, the servants, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler of many things. And notice he says, enter into the joy of your Lord. Uh, so the, there is a, a particular joy when we participate in uh, with, with our Lord Jesus Christ, you know, uh, in, in, in everything we do. Does that make sense uh, to anyone? Yes, Bertram, go ahead. Uh, make sure you unmute. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I think uh, uh, added to what uh, Suryamuthi mentioned and Vincent mentioned, I would add trust, trust and obey. Uh, it's uh, it's the matter of the heart uh, that, we, as you say, Zacharias, the joy of participation. Yes, uh, we know what God has. We recognize it, and we uh, uh, we hum we are humble about it. We appreciate. We thank God. And uh, 
uh, we uh, we want to do what God is, uh, where there's little or more uh, as to one's ability. Uh, we uh, uh, we want to trust and obey. We want to honor Him. Uh, that uh, that is, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, one could do or uh, would uh, would uh, would give joy to the person and uh, love, joy, and peace. And also, I think God would be pleased uh, uh, that uh, we are uh, knowing about it. And, and, uh, and uh, our heart is uh, looking to him, trusting and obeying and honoring him. Thank you, Bharti. Yes, I think uh, the word, when you say, when you use the word trust, I think it uh, specifically uh, applies to the third servant who did not trust. Uh, he did not trust the master. And so, yes, uh, uh, I think uh, that's very much something that we can, uh, you know, include in our discussion. Very good. <coughs> yes, Anil, go ahead. I think uh, one more thing implied in this whole thing is the, like God says, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And so if you're using your resources to help others, to further the kingdom and so on, I mean, you're giving it. And then you're also sort of receiving that joy, you know, that God says, come enter into my joy. So, you know, you're blessed by giving and hence you're, uh, you, you will be joyful with God. So that's also implied in it. And that's how I think the stewards should also view that, that we have to uh, give joyfully and hence uh, receive joyfully. Fair enough. Uh, I think that's very uh, apt to mention uh, that stewardship involves giving and we are specifically told not to, I mean, to make sure it benefits others. And that is uh, a characteristic of God, isn't it? I mean, God is a giver. Uh, he gives and gives and gives. And uh, Perhaps if I can just also mention that um, finally we are in a relationship with God and that relationship is dynamic. Uh, it's, a, it's a relationship where there is giving and receiving and uh, making space for one another and, uh, and uh, the whole concept of stewardship comes into play uh, where uh, life is joyfully busy as we engage in that dynamic relationship with God Almighty and with one another. Uh, Surimurthy, did you have a comment? I just want to repeat my same point from a different perspective. We used to work in the office, offices we, we used to give work to different employees. The employees whom, who, who like us, they would not only do the work which we give, but will, they will do more work than we give. If you say you type these two pages, he will go and type four pages. If you say you go to this village, he will not only go to that village, but will go to several other villages and finish the work. But the fellow who does not like us, he will sit idly. So it's a question of loving. Okay. The person who loves God, he will eagerly do much more than what is required or what is expected. But the fellow who does not like, he, he will be like this third category. Having cut down for God in mind. Yeah. Interesting. Yes, I think what you're saying is love is a motivating factor. Uh, it motivates one to go above and beyond, isn't it? Uh, in in fact, the Bible says that. Uh, so, uh, and loving God, uh, you know, we we go uh, we go beyond even the written code. As it is, as we understand and know from the New Testament. Because the first category of a person loves, loves God very much, he goes and trades happily. The second category also goes and trades happily. 
Right. And the third category of person does not love God. Okay. All right. Uh, interesting thoughts. And uh, uh, anybody wants to touch upon uh, uh, to make it more practical, what are the ways that we can be stewards? What are the things we have that can make a difference you know, in the lives of others, the way we can engage with uh, the world, with our neighbors, with the church. Uh, anyone wants to uh, look into that? I think one of the first things you will mention is money. <laughs> when we talk about stewardship, how do we use our money? And uh, silver and, and gold, I have none. Silver <laughs> and gold, I have I none. Right. So Suryamurthy says, I don't have silver and gold, but I have something else to give. So what can you give for us, Suryamurthy? Love. Main thing is love for other human beings. The yeah. moment you have the love for other human beings, you will go to any extent to help him. All right. Or talk with him. Even talk with him. You need not help. You can talk with him joyfully in a friendly manner. Okay. Wherever we are, our presence will be felt by them. Okay. There are so many people who come to me, from laborers to people who are working in the office, old associates. When they come to me, they sit with me and they don't leave me. Right. So you are loving them. <laughs> yes, I, I, I am not ashamed. I am not. Uh, I I want to acknowledge that. Yeah. But you know, somewhere of course it says. Uh, I think Jesus or Peter mentions that if you see somebody, uh, you know, uh, cold and needing some uh, warm clothing and you say, oh, be blessed and, you know, be happy and walk away. I mean, that doesn't really, uh, you know, you're not really helping. You're showing your love and saying, yeah, be encouraged and all that. But you're not really helping him by maybe providing him with warmth, uh, warm clothes or whatever. So it has to be a you know, a, a giving attitude. Love, of course, definitely you'll give from, out of love, but from your possessions also, it could be your time, it could be your abilities that you're using, or, or money, as you said. Yeah. Money creates problems. Depends how you use it. <laughs> yes, uh, und undoubtedly. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the love that, that we talk about is the motivating factor. But what are the resources that we have that we can uh, employ, that we can sort of use? Any thoughts on that? Well, our time, our abilities. Okay. Yes. We have, to, we have the wisdom of God, so we can uh, tell people about it more and more. And you look for opportunities to talk about the kingdom more and more. Okay. Right. Yeah. It's interesting. You use word wisdom. Yeah. That is, that is something uh, we can, we can, especially the wisdom of God, we can impart. Yes. Surya Murthy, go ahead. We cannot codify the gifts. And uh, from my point of view, we, We respond to each situation as God presents to us. It is not as if each situation is present presents itself to us. In my opinion, it may be a small matter, but God is pre presenting the situation to us to see how we respond. It is a lifetime process. Okay, well, um, I would say that God is not just seeing how we, sh we respond, but he wants us to respond. <laughs> I think uh, uh, he Father, wants us to be successful. He wants us to succeed. He wants us to represent him. Right? I agree. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think uh, Anil, you mentioned time. Time is uh, another resource that uh, can be tremendously useful and uh, giving time to others right which is something which is uh, which is a problem today i guess uh, 
Many people have no time. <laughs> right. I have plenty of time. <laughs> right. Okay. Any other points or comments that can help? Yes, Bertie, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Anil Lagar uh, pointed out the practical aspect of it. And uh, we should, uh, def we should, uh, this, is, this is definitely uh, uh, what we should reflect to others. Uh, because we, uh, they, uh, um, as he said, he said, you know, be warmed and be, uh, you know, be fed without doing it practical, without, uh, without actually giving him and uh, providing him. Uh, God says, uh, you know, uh, as you're able to, uh, we can't, uh, we can't forget that as a, you know, as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, time, yes. Time, effort, service, yes. But uh, practically, practically, uh, we should be doing the thing that God, uh, uh, God expects us to do uh, by His Spirit guiding us, by being, by belonging to Him. Very true, uh, Bertie. And yes, <clears throat> and I must mention that so many of uh, you have, you know, been uh, available to serve, to help, and so yes. You are practically being stewards. Sikandar, you had a thought. Go ahead. <coughs> sir, who is steward, sir? Everyone called out once. Everyone is a steward, I think. Everyone in his capacity as a member or pastor or deacon or a choir member, they have to contribute to the fullest of their capacity to the church. God called us into the church to proclaim God's gospel from the beginning to from the beginning uh, that is from the day we called out our capacity that is uh, whichever talent we are having we have to use that in the church in the into the fullest manner. That is my view sir. In general, uh, any church for we work, we have to work completely. We have to uh, get the resources uh, about the, the word of God and behave in such a way that is behaving means God has put in us the grace and the love. Uh, the love of God and the word of God is in us. Through that, the talent comes out. The talent has to be used in its fullest manner, whether it is finance or whatever it is. That is my answer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sikandar. Yes, very true, isn't it? Uh, that we, um, whatever in whatever way we can participate, uh, we do. Bertie, you want to come back on that? Yes. Uh, yes, what uh, what Sikandar uh, mentioned is uh, uh, is uh, the good works that uh, flow from us as a disciple of Christ, and we have to re very 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 important to remember that Christ in us enables us, the Spirit in us enables us to do the good works. Uh, I can I don't know which passage uh, which I can't quote the exact this thing, but it says. Uh, the good works that uh, flow from us through, uh, through Jesus Christ, uh, you know, with us, uh, brings uh, praise, glory, and honor to God. So what uh, what uh, each one who has mentioned about obedience, about loving, caring, about, uh, you know, uh, practical practical Christianity, like uh, Mr. Nagar mentioned, and what uh, Sikandar mentioned just now about, you know, uh, it is the uh, our calling, it is Christ who enables us uh, to make that talent, to make that um, uh, make that works show forth, the good work. Uh, the Bible says we were made for good works. So, and we should remember that uh, uh, it is Christ who enables us. Christ, we need Christ's help, uh, uh, just as we need Christ's help to prevent us from slipping, from falling, 
if we have sinned, uh, you know, unintentionally to confess it and to actually do the good works, which will bring God praise and honor. It is Christ who wants us to do this. So that uh, the, the question that the, the word participation is very important, whether it's fellowship, whether it's communion with the, with the son, son of God, whether it's uh, uh, whether it's a mission and ministry of the son, we all are participating in. We have to remember it. Yeah. Very true, uh, Bertie. And uh, maybe we can remind ourselves that uh, it is Christ's ministry that we are involved in. It is not our ministry. Uh, it, it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to God. And so in that respect, it's only Christ who can empower us. But to keep in mind, uh, the important thing is, uh, do we recognize the giftings, the resources, the talents that we have, number one. Secondly, are we deliberately, uh, consciously employing it in kingdom work? So these two are perhaps uh, paramount for a steward to recognize that we have been given resources through various types of giftings. <clears throat> and secondly, Am I making sure that they are being employed? It should not be hid like, or remain idle like the <clears throat> third servant. So those two points I would say is something that uh, defines a steward, a steward from a biblical perspective. Any final comments as we <clears throat> wind down here for today? Sorry, Murthy, go ahead. As uh, some of our friends have said, like Bertie, it all reduces to one thing. The good stewardship uh, comes automatically by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Undoubtedly, yes. The ministry of the Holy Spirit continues on today. And uh, we are told not to quench the Spirit but to allow him to lead us. So there is a need for us to be very conscious and sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. <clears throat> right, so a Christian can never be idle. <clears throat> there is something or the other that he or she is doing. Uh, yes, Bertie? Yes, uh, there is a mention in the Bible of the unprofitable servant who lost out. So as, uh, as you mentioned, uh, as all of us are mentioning, we have to be conscious of God's working, uh, uh, conscious about a gift. Yes, he has done us. He has uh, equipped us. Uh, the Bible says uh, we were made for good works and uh, we are enabled to do the good works and uh, we have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Yeah, acknowledging Christ in us that actually enables us uh, to uh, to live a life which is pleasing to the Father and uh, uh, which is in conformity to the Word of God. It's it's uh, it's really that we have to be profitable. God wants to see us, uh, you know, yielding fruit in our life. What God wants us to see to to acknowledge Him that He has called us and established us for good works, and that it is He who does it uh, in and through us. And we should not be like the unprofitable servant who lost out. Uh, or the or the or the foolish virgins uh, who were given and who didn't see and didn't recognize or deliberate or uh, or, or otherwise uh, did not uh, you know use the giftings or use the Holy Spirit and did not bring good work. They lost out also, mm -hmm. uh, although they were gifted, although they were called or called ones, called out ones, and uh, uh, we should be a little aware of that. Uh, in our in our Christian calling, in our Christian living, in our kingdom work, kingdom job, kingdom uh, service. Yes, um, uh, I think we uh, we are trying our best to put you know the works and everything in its right perspective. Uh, obviously, we must keep in mind that uh, uh, you know our salvation is not of works; uh, it is of the grace of God, but. Uh, the works that accompany 
the grace of God is very much something that we put in the right perspective. And so, yes, like I said, the Christian life is indeed, uh, you know, an active life, a dynamic life, constantly living, living out the gospel, growing and continuing to uh, follow the lead of the Holy Spirit. Well, I hope you have all uh, been uh, enriched by this series of spiritual disciplines. I hope that they have added a dimension to your Christian lives. Uh, let's not forget, we, have, we, we went through almost uh, you know, eight or nine or 10 of them. Uh, and uh, so today we will end the series on spiritual discipline. We'll come back to you on uh, what we plan uh, as we move forward. So don't forget some of those disciplines that we talked about. And I think they are aspects of our Christian life. That is how we engage uh, in the Christian life and with one another. And of course, uh, in the <clears throat> strength and power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so <clears throat> thank you for your participation, your comments. Uh, they're all very, very helpful. All right. Uh, before we end, any com uh, uh, any announcements or anything, Praveen? Uh, is there something that we need to inform our members? Right. Okay. <clears throat> so we will keep you all uh, posted on uh, uh, how we will proceed with the Bible studies. But this will be a regular feature on uh, on online uh, because we can. It's a, such a privilege to connect with many of you who are uh, in uh, far-flung areas. So uh, this is something that we will continue to do. If you have any comments or rather suggestions or any, uh, any thoughts that can help us plan well, please feel free to share them with us. All right. We will try our best to put our minds to uh, how we can do a good systematic study so that these evenings are well used. Okay, having said that, uh, <clears throat> may I request Bertie if you can close in prayer today? Thank you. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this uh, time uh, together, which uh, you, Lord, uh, enables and which is uh, pleasing and acceptable to you, Lord, when we uh, and during uh, uh, the time we spend, Lord, you help us also to be able to, Lord, understand, to grow, to receive and uh, perceive, uh, to be an attitude of gratitude, Lord. We are reminded and we just thank you. We thank you for our pastor, uh, senior pastor, Pastor Dan Zachariah, Lord, who has, uh, who has uh, Lord, labored in the word and uh, provided us the series, Lord, of uh, uh, the different aspects of Christian uh, discipline, which has been uh, so good, Lord, and we just want you to bless him and his family. We want you to him to be recovered, Lord, fully from uh, uh, this virus, Lord, along with all the others who are affected by it. We thank you. You are doing it, Lord. You are very much involved with our lives, and you want us to be growing, knowing and growing. And these Bible studies, Lord, uh, uh, make us uh, make us really are profitable to us. And uh, Lord, helps us to be established in your ways. Because your ways, Lord, are, are pleasantness. And your, Lord, your paths are, Lord, peace. And we, Lord, we are blessed for it, indeed. Thank you, Father, for this time uh, you brought us together. And we ask you to continue to bless your people with healing, deliverance, and, Lord, uh, blessings of goodness and help because these are good for us, Lord. Uh, like the principle of giving, the Lord says, when you give, you are blessed uh, and take your time and remember others, you are blessed because, Lord, it is your way of life and your paths of life, eternal life. We are in the truth, Lord, and we want you to continue to bless us with the truth of the word of, of the word of God, of the gospel, and continue to bless our future. Uh, Bible study. Thank you, Lord. We have concluded the series of Christian disciplines uh, today. And uh, thank you for the speakers. Thank you for Zechariah and others who have commented and who are participating. Thank you for this time, Lord, and bless your people. We pray this prayer, Father God, in Jesus Christ's holy and blessed name. Amen.